to what's going to happen next year, how close is the Lord's return, when is it going to happen? Uh, we have a bit of a dilemma when we uh, ask that question of ourselves because we, we uh, are warned not to ask about times and seasons and dates. In fact, that sets you up for making a mistake and makes you look silly in front of other people. What you need to look at are the events. And the events tell you, if you keep your eyes peeled and you keep your eyes on the scripture, you can see what might be next in the sequence of events and you give you an idea of when the Lord will return. Now, we've all got a feeling that it's very, very soon. I think all of us feel that. And that feeling goes right around the world amongst the brotherhood. Now, there is, talking about events and understanding what is going on, one of the things we saw in the reading is that Sir King Herod didn't know what was going on. And so he consulted some of his fellow Jews, if we could say, his fellow Jews, and he did that because some wise men or magi had come from the east, probably somewhere near Babylon, and they had come to worship Jesus, and they were going to Bethlehem. But he he snaffled them before they got there and asked them, uh, asked these, um, where, where's, where should we find this king? And we see there's a prophecy that the, the chief priests um, demanded of him, verse 4 of that chapter, of where Christ should be born. And the expert said to him, in Bethlehem of Judea, for thus it is written by the prophet. And then they quote the prophecy. And thou, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, art not the least among the princes of Judah, for out of thee shall become a governor that shall rule my people Israel. And of course, that is the Lord Jesus Christ. He was born in Bethlehem, according to that prophecy. Now, interestingly, that, just looking at that prophecy alone tells you that you need to know your prophecies. But this chapter is very, um, very tricky because we get introduced to some prophecies which we wouldn't think were related to the coming of the Lord and his early days. So, uh, of course, we know the story of how we read there about how uh, Joseph took Mary and um, Jesus into Egypt. And you see in verse 15, it says that this happened, that it might be fulfilled, which is spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, out of Egypt have I called my son. Now, that prophet was Hosea, and the prophecy is in uh, chapter 11 of Hosea, if you want to look it up. But not many people, if it were ourselves, looking at the Old Testament, would have picked that as a prophecy about the coming of the Lord or his early life. Similarly, the one from Jeremiah 33 in verse 17, and it quotes Jeremy the prophet, in Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping, and great mourning, Rachel weeping for her children, and would not be comforted because they are not. And this is a reference to the killing of the innocents in Bethlehem, who were from two years old and under, and that order was given by Herod. Again, we probably would not have looked at that prophecy. And then, of course, um, Joseph and Mary and Jesus came back from Egypt a few years later and he went to Galilee. And it says in verse 23, and he came and dwelt in a city called Nazareth that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by the prophets, he shall be called a Nazarene. And interestingly, those words do not appear in the Bible at all, but we can claim that they were spoken by the prophets and people knew about them. So what it's telling you is that you really do have to know your Bible quite well uh, in order to understand when Messiah comes. Now, in the case of uh, the chief priests and the scribes and uh, Herod, they got it all wrong because they didn't probably care, but neither did they understand the prophecies. They had one, one little prophecy they understood and some they didn't understand. Now, if we turn to uh, Micah chapter 5, where this... Uh, prophecy which is referred to in Matthew chapter 2 
come from. So we turn back there and have a little look at that. It's in the Minor Prophets. Now, we'll find it in verse 2 of Micah 5, and it says there, and I'm going to read a little bit more, because it's only pointing you in the general direction. And it says there, But thou, Bethlehem Ephratah, though thou be little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of thee shall he come forth unto me that is to be ruler in Israel, whose goings forth have been from of old, from everlasting. Therefore, this is the ruler, will he give them up, Israel, give Israel up, until the time that she which travails, or gives birth, has brought forth, or gives birth to a baby, to children. Then the remnant of his brethren shall return unto the children of Israel, and he shall stand and feed in the strength of the Lord, in the majesty of the name of the Lord his God. And they shall abide, for now he shall be great unto the ends of the earth. That's the rest of the prophecy. And it's telling him, telling us that the first bit that was quoted in Matthew chapter 2 was concerning his birth, but there's much more to the story. And what we're told here is that he gives up on Israel. He gives them up. And of course what happened to... The, the Jews in the first century was that they were destroyed by the Romans in AD 70 and then they were sent out to all the world and persecuted and then after about 1900 years they were brought back and what this is saying that the, it says the she which travails has brought forth that she is Jerusalem and I can show that from other prophecies and travailing is coming into crisis and when Jerusalem is saying Jesus will give up the Jews until Jerusalem comes into crisis and then she gives birth to children and then the remnant of his brothers shall return unto the children of Israel. Now if you have a little bit of an inkling of the language being used there, the children are the children of Jerusalem. If you look in the Psalms, we won't, haven't got time to look at that now, you see that's to do with those who are made immortal. The children of Jerusalem are those who have been believers and who are uh, brought out of death, resurrected to immortality. They are the children of Jerusalem. And the remnant of his brethren, they shall return unto the children of Israel too. Then, after that, so you have a resurrection and then you have... Uh, the rest of his brothers, and in the New Testament, Gentile believers are described in Hebrews chapter 2 as the brothers of Christ. It's our name, Christadelphian. And so it was telling us that right at the crisis of Jerusalem, there's a resurrection and a return of all his brothers to that city. Now, if we come back to Isaiah 66, it uses very similar language to that, and you can hopefully see that it's talking about the same events, or well, some of the same events. And I want you to come down, and this chapter is talking about Jerusalem. And we can pick that up in verse 6. A voice of noise from the city, and this whole end of Isaiah has been talking about Jerusalem, but the word's not close by here for me to show you that in verse 6 it's the city of Jerusalem and it says there before she travailed she brought forth before her pain came she was delivered of a man child and what we take that to be the Christ himself so before he comes before the big crisis in Jerusalem at the end of time but then it says in verse 8 who has heard such a thing who has seen such things shall the earth be made to bring forth in one day or shall a nation be born at once? And then it says, For as soon as Zion travailed, she brought forth her children. Exactly the same language as Micah 5. So as soon as the crisis occurs in Jerusalem, the resurrected children of Zion or Jerusalem are born. And he says, Shall I bring to the birth and not cause to bring forth? So 
just the nation, the whole plan, his whole plan, it's pregnant. Do you go through to the end of the pregnancy and give birth to the children of God? Of course he does. So there we've got a hint that the, at the time of the coming of the Lord, there's a resurrection and it all happens very, very quickly. Now, just quickly turn, we know that the nation of Israel to be born again has to be forgiven by Jesus Christ. And here in verse 19, it says, Behold, at that time, I will undo all that afflict thee, and I will save her that halteth, as a reference to Israel, and Jacob in particular, and gather her that was driven out, and I will get them praise and fame in every land uh, where they have been put to shame. And at that time I'll bring you again, even in the time that I gather for you. I will make you a name and a praise among all people of the earth when I turn back your captivity before your eyes. And basically, they are going to be forgiven in a very short period of time. Now, there's uh, one other little passage I want to look at. And it's Isaiah 60. If you turn to that now, which is a few chapters before the one we looked at before. And this chapter, if you go to the beginning of it, uh, it well, again, it's talking about Jerusalem. It's a prophecy about Jerusalem. And in verse 21, for context, it says, thy people also shall be all righteous in this future age. They shall inherit the land forever, the land of Israel, the branch of my planting, the work of my hands, that I, God, may be glorified. A little one shall become a thousand, and a small one a strong nation. I, the Lord, will hasten it in its time. He's going to hurry it along. All the events will unwind very quickly at a time of crisis in Jerusalem when the Lord returns. Now, one of the things we read there was that uh, it, it's all to do, all these events are going to be occurring in the land of Israel. And if we have a little look at um, a very well-known prophecy in Joel, this will sort of fit us into where we're, we're at in a way in, in terms of... Uh, modern history. And so we should look at Joel 3. And I'm reading from the New American Standard Version here. Uh, for behold, in those days and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I will gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. Then I will enter into judgment with them there on behalf of my people and my inherent Israel. Now, for anyone who's lived for any period of time in the 20th century, you'll be quite aware that the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem came about in the 20th century not called Judah, but in the land of Judah, was the nation of Israel restored in 1948. And in 1967, in the Six Day War, the Jews retook Jerusalem. So it says, in those days and at that time when I do that, in that era, I'm going to gather all the nations of the world and bring them to the Valley of Jehoshaphat. I just mentioned there that if you've got a Bible in front of you, it might have the meaning of that name Jehoshaphat in, in the margin and it means God judgment. Now what I want to do is just quickly show you, uh, well mention it anyway, in Revelation chapter 16 is a word that the whole world is familiar with and that's the word Armageddon. And what it says in Revelation 16 is much the same as what we just read there. And I'm turning that up and I'll read it to you. And 
I'm reading, going to read from Revelation 16, verse uh, 12. And the sixth angel poured out his bowl upon the great river, the Euphrates, and its water was dried up, that the way might be prepared for the kings from the east. And I saw coming out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, and the mouth of the false prophet, three unclean spirits like frogs. For they are the spirits of demons, or of mad people, performing signs which go to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. Behold, I'm coming like a thief, says the Lord. In a little parenthesis here. Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his garments, lest he walk about naked and men see his shame. And that's inserted there between the, next, the previous verse and the next verse, where it says, and they were gathered. That's the nations were gathered together into the place in the Hebrew, which is called Armageddon. And interestingly, Armageddon means a heap of sheaves in a valley of judgment. And if you quickly go back to um, Joel chapter 3, we see in verse 12, it says, Let the nations be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, the valley of God's judgment, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Come tread, for the winepress is full. So it makes mention of harvesting and connected with that is the idea of sheaves. So in the end of the harvesting is a heap of sheaves in the valley of judgment. So the two prophecies are talking about the same thing. And you'll see with that slide I've got up at the moment, we know these events were in that time. Israel became a state 60, 70 years ago. Sorry, get the math right. 70 years ago. Oh, oh dear, I thought it was the big one. Now you see it, and one slide out. That one there, there's from the Palestine Post in May 1948. So we know we're in that times, and if we, uh, we can look at another little prophecy in the New Testament, Luke chapter 21, And this also puts us in the place. Now, the, one of the problems we have in presenting material like this is there's a great, huge prophecy here, and I'm going to just pluck a verse out of here. But the early part of it is talking leading the, all the events that lead up to the destruction of Jerusalem uh, nearly 2,000 years ago. And the Jewish people, it says in verse 23, Woe to those who are with child or those who nurse babes in those days, for there will be great distress upon the land of Israel or Judah, and wrath to this people, Jesus is speaking here, to his own people. And they, the Jews, will fall by the edge of the sword and be led captive into all nations, and Jerusalem shall be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles, the non-Jews, non until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And I go on, and there will be signs in the sun, the moon, and the stars, and upon the earth, dismay among the nation, in perplexity at the roaring of the waves and the sea and the waves, men fainting from fear for the expectation of the things which are coming upon the world, for the powers of the heavens will be shaken, meaning the world rulers. And then they will see the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, coming in a cloud with power and great glory. What I'm pointing out here, though, the lead up to that is, is hidden away a little bit. It says Jerusalem will be trampled underfoot by the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. And so if you're out in 1967, in June, you would have seen that photo on the right there. Oops, no you wouldn't. I'll see it, you won't, until I press that button. And there we are, the one with the guy with the eye patch. Moshe Diane, I think the one, uh, oh, I don't remember who the one to the left of him is, but I saw that as an 11 year old and it really moved me back in 1967 as an 11 year old. It seemed something very empowering by that photo. But what it was telling us was that the Jews had taken control of Jerusalem once more 
And so that Joel prophecy, the second part of it, had been basically fulfilled. So we knew that we're in the time when all the nations of the earth would be gathered to the land of Israel and that would lead into the um, presentation of the Lord Jesus Christ to the world. Now, from this hall, many, many times, we uh, talk about one of the group of nations that is really involved in that invasion of the land of Israel who are gathered to, to the Middle East. And that prophecy is Ezekiel chapter 38. And just have a quick look at it, not too long. Just want you to have it, glance your eyes over it and see some of the, the words there. I'll just point, highlight them for a minute because I want to talk about them. Now what you see in the beginning of chapter 38 of Ezekiel, the word of the Lord came unto me, that's under Ezekiel, saying, Son of man, set your face toward Gog of the land of Magog, the prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, and prophesy against him. I'm reading from the NASB. Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I'm against you, O Gog, prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, and I'll turn you about and put hooks into your jaws and bring you out, all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired, a great company with buckler and shield, all them wielding swords, Persia, Ethiopia, and put with them, all of them with shield and helmet, Gomer with all his troops, Beth Togomar from the north, remote parts of north with all its troops, many peoples with you. Be prepared, prepare yourself and all your companies that are assembled about you and be a guard for them. This is addressed to the Go, the leader of this group of armies. After many days you'll be summoned in the latter years, you'll come into the land that is restored from the sword, whose inhabitants have been gathered from many nations to the mountains of Israel. We've just been reading about that in Joel. So we're in the right, this invasion is in our time. And if we look at verse 16, it says in verse 16, you'll come up against my people Israel like a cloud to cover the land. It will come about in the last days that I shall bring you against my land in order that the nations may know me when I'll be sanctified through you before your eyes, O Gog. And he adds, he says, thus says the Lord God, are you the one of whom I spoke in former days through my servants, the prophets of Israel, who prophesied in those days for many years that I would bring you against them. So he's reminding at the time that to the leader of this power that it's spoken about a long, long time ago. Now, I'm going to jump one or two here. Because I want to... Now, I want to deal with this uh, prophecy mainly to bring us into where we're at at the moment. Now, he says there that Gog is of the land of Magog. Now, if we have a look at ancient historians like Josephus, he identifies Magog with the Scythians. And if you use the rule of um, thumb that the nation he's referring to is where he was, in Ezekiel's time, then the Scythians um, were in the region shown in this map. And I'll just um, in around the beginning of the sixth century BC, that was where Scythia was. And so it basically amounts to Eurasia. Some other historians closer to the New Testament times say that there were Scythians. Uh, north of India and towards Mongolia. So basically the entire Russian territory. Now what happened, you can also look at uh, other historians who say that, uh, like Herodotus, that at this time the Scythians were on the move and pushing ever westward. And at the time of Ezekiel, uh, well at the time of Herodotus, they got to the river Danube, but at 600, they were at the River Don, which is at uh, the border of um, the Ukraine. So if you um, 
split the difference, you find they've probably got about halfway between those two points and about how that map shows it, right? That's where the Scythians were. So the leader comes out of that nation and beyond. And that corresponds in our time, in the last days, to Russia, that territory. Now, the next thing is, now I've got some more maps here which will demonstrate that sort of point, showing where the Scythians are. There's one there. Now, what's interesting um, next, though, is the title that is given to this leader. He's called Gog. Now, that in the Hebrew means roof. It so happens that there's a very common word used in everyday language in, in places like Belarus, Russia, Ukraine, which describes a criminal protector of people, one who gives protection. And they use the word krusha. And that word krusha also means roof. And so we're getting a bit of an idea here that this leader is a protector, a criminal protector of people. And you can look at various uh, passage, uh, stories on the, um, online, which um, yeah, I'll show you this one here. Oh, I can read it if I, I get a bit closer because the writing is very small. Um, Tsar Vladimir Putin, KGB Kremlin, Golden Boy, Khrushchev's roofs in Russian are very important in Russia, but no Khrushchev is more important than the one in the Kremlin. Just ask Vlad the Impaler. Um, and then it talks about Putin was, and this name is a Russian uh, businessman. He was his Khrushchev, and. In the very next slide, I'll show you there, Putin is described as Russia's Khrushchev or roof. He is the man at the top. He is the man that gives criminal protection. And it's no wonder that um, Russia was called by uh, Julian Assange a kleptocracy, the style of rule. Kleptomania, they steal stuff. And it's giving you a clue that what what government we're talking about here. So it's the land of Mago, the territory occupied by the Scythians in the past, but corresponds to modern Russia. Then it says it's Prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. But I'm gonna, I'm gonna deal with um, verse four next. Sorry, um, I'm losing my way here, because I'm looking at verse chapter 39, that's why. Um, First up, verse 5 names the allies. Persia, Ethiopia and Put are with them, all of them with shield and helmet. Now, Persia we know as Iran and they are allied with Russia in the civil war in Syria. Ethiopia is the Hebrew Kush and it refers to Sudan as a long-term ally of Russia and Libya, of course Libya in the spring, Arab Spring had Gaddafi assassinated and then they went into the wilderness for the last seven years but now Russia is supporting General Haftar in Benghazi. The word put there, which is the Hebrew name for Libya, refers to the eastern half of Libya and uh, so General Haftar is in charge of the eastern half and that's the one half of Libya that Russia is working with. So what we can say there, those three allies are already lined up with Russia. If we go to verse 6, the very next verse, still dealing with the allies, Goma with all its troops and the house of Tagama from the remote parts of the north to Israel. Goma is commonly assumed to be the Cimmerians and prior to the Scythians invading uh, the Crimean region 
uh, the Khmerians lived there, but they were pushed out and in a, over a hundred year period they got pushed into the Hungarian plain. And there we have countries like Serbia. So in the time of Ezekiel, that's where they were. The Khmerians were in the Hungarian plain of which Serbia is part. And of course, Serbia is one of the chiefest uh, allies of the Russians. They are in place. Togomar, according to the Armenians, is them. Togomar is Armenia. And if you care to check it out, you'll find that Armenia has signed a treaty, a military treaty with Russia till 2044. And they are one of their most strategic allies in the region. So the five allies named for MAGO, Iran, Sudan, Libya, S S Serbia and Armenia are all now currently allies of Russia, ready to go. So there's, um, and there's a map showing you, uh, on the left it shows, actually, because I took this off the internet, and you'll see there, if you can read it, the map on the left, it's got the Khmerians shown in the green, right in the middle of Eastern Europe, and that's roughly where Serbia is. And again, we show it on the, on the right there where Serbia is. And of course the Serbians love Russia, and you can check that out on any news service to do with Serbia and Russia. Just type the two words in and you'll see what their relationship is. It's very close. And if we look at Togomar, there was Armenia in history, that's in ancient times, about 300 BC on the left, and of course the map on the right is what it is today, right on the border of Turkey, and it's a Russian ally. And in July last year, they created a unified army between the Russians and Armenia. Now, let's jump to the next verse. It says, be prepared, speaking to the leader, the leader of Russia, be prepared and prepare yourself, you and all your companies or armies that are assembled about you and be a guard for them. So what we expect to see there is some preparation for war by the Russians. And in fact, it goes, further than that, what we find is that uh, Mr Putin, who's currently the leader of Russia, often uses the phrase, we've got to be prepared for war, we've got to be battle ready. He's used that phrase many, many times because since about 2011, there have been countless military drills, not just small ones, big ones. And uh, this year in September, you might remember that they ran a drill in Siberia in which they used 300,000 troops and 100,000 pieces of military equipment. And his words were, we've got to be battle ready, which is virtually paraphrasing verse 7 there, be prepared. He's taken that on board. And you can go through and check it all out yourself. I've got heaps of stuff here on it. But the, the next slide tells you, shows you some of the major ones. But uh, if I were to write a complete list of all the military drills that Russia has uh, undertaken in the last seven years, uh, I'd have about 30 slides. They have been, had massive preparation for war. So here we go, there's just a few of them. And on and on we go. And with it, uh, Russian military spending has soared. Um, to levels not seen before. And all the time he's adding new weapons. He was boasting about one the other day, a hypersonic nuclear missile, which outdoes anything in the West. And of course, they've had drills in the Black Sea, which are necessary if they're going to advance uh, into the Middle East. 
as we know from the prophecy in Daniel chapter 11, which corresponds to the Ezekiel 38 prophecy, we haven't got time to look at it, it says that they use many ships to uh, create the invasion of the Middle East. And that would ostensibly be the Black Sea Fleet. And always talking about combat readiness, the Russians. There's another one, headline, 7th of February last year. Putin orders Russian Air Force to prepare for time of war. It's almost the same language, isn't it? And there's the uh, drill from this year that I mentioned. 297,000 troops, 36,000 pieces of ground force equipment, 1,000 aircraft, and the Chinese and the Mongolians were involved as well. All right. The next point that's made is that uh, the invasion is against the people gathered out of many people who live in the mountains of Israel. And uh, the only people we know that's happened to is the Jewish people. And they've been brought, brought back from the late 19th century into the 20th century. And there they are, you know, a thorn in the side of all the other Arabs in the area. What's interesting, though, is if you read into it, the mountains of Israel is the mountains of Ephraim. That's the West Bank. And what it's telling you is at the time of the Russian invasion, uh, they will be living there. No two-state solution will have come about. They will still be living in the West Bank. And uh, if we go to verse 12 in that chapter 38, and I'll go to the next slide to do it. And this is part of a sort of a, a, a thought that comes to the Russian leader. And actually, I'll read that to you from chapter 38 of Ezekiel. And it starts in verse 11. It says, and this is the Russian leader speaking, I'll go up against the land of unwalled villages. I'll go to them who are at rest, that live securely, all of them without walls and having no bars or gates, to capture spoil, the seize plunder, to turn your hand against the waste places which are now inhabited, against the people who are gathered from the nations who acquired Catholic goods and who live, and this is the NASB translation, centre of the world. But when you look at that word centre, in other translations, like the one I've got up there for you, is the midst of the land. But when you look at the Hebrew word, it actually means the high places of the land, the mountaintops. The Jews would occupy the mountaintops of Israel. And that's where all the Jewish settlements are. As the next slide shows you, that's a typical photograph of a Jewish settlement. And they, for uh, security reasons, sit on top of the mountain ridges. Now, I did seem to get out of order there before because there was, I wanted to deal with this next issue now. And that is verse 2 in chapter 38. Uh, and it says there that the, the Gog of the land of Magog is the Prince of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. Now in the King James Version, if you've been looking at that, you'll see Chief Prince of Meshach and Tubal. The word chief there is in the Hebrew Rosh and the Septuagint Bible, which is translated about 287 BC, actually uses the proper name Rosh. So it treated it as a, a, a name. So what it's telling us is this that at the end time, that the leader of Russia will have control, to a certain extent, of Rosh, Meshach and Tubal. Now, if you do your real homework on the real origins of the name Rosh, Meshach and Tubal, you will find that Rosh refers to the Crimea and the Donbass, Meshach to eastern Georgia, and Tubal to the central part of Georgia, which is in the Caucasian mountains, just south of Russia. Now this is significant because with God working to bring all this about, oh, actually I'll leave that there for you. That's tricking me all the time. It's, I've got on the, on the, on the uh, laptop here a big slide, which I always, when I look at it, looks like it's the main one. And there's a little one on the left of it, which is the one you're seeing. I get tricked by it all the time. Um, now, let's deal with Meshach and Tubal first. If you look at ancient Assyrian annals and uh, 
historians like the fellow I mentioned before, Josephus, they place them in the, in the Caucasus. And every other historian does that. And if you go into the Middle Ages, there are provinces there called Mescia and uh, Tabali and all sorts of things like that, very similar to the name used in the Old Testament Bible. Now, everyone remembers the war in 2008 in Georgia? Yes, around the time, about the time of the um, Olympic Games. What happened? Well, Russia invaded Georgia and ended up taking up two provinces. And they are called, in our time, Abkhazia and South Ossetia. And there's Georgia on the left prior to 2008. On the right, if you see the, can see the different tones, it, it points out Abkhazia and South Ossetia, and they are now not part of Georgia. Effectively, they're part of Russia, not quite. They're said to be independent nations. Some people recognise it, some people don't. But South Ossetia corresponds exactly to the ancient territory of Tubal, and Abkhazia to the ancient territory of Meshek. And the import of the 2008 war was for Russia to get hold of these two little bits of land so they were then the Prince of Meshek and Tubal. And of course, six years later, with the stoush between the Ukrainians and the Russians, Russia started up a little bit of a civil war in the Donbass, which is eastern Ukraine, and then they took Crimea, and so they now, in 2014, had control of Rosh of ancient times. Not the modern name. Of course, the name Russia comes from Rosh, but there's a long convoluted story to that. And so it wasn't until Crimea was taken that this prophecy could proceed. So in 2014, Russia took Crimea. The very next year, what did Russia do? They moved into Syria. And see, we see the next ver couple of verses there. Verse 4 of chapter 38 says, I'll turn you about and put hooks into your jaws, and I'll bring you out and all your army, horses and horsemen, all of them splendidly attired. And they brought into the land of Israel eventually. But they are pulled out of their comfort zone and drawn towards the Middle East. That happened in 2015. All right? So that could not have occurred until... Russia had taken Misha, Shubal, and Rosh. 2008, 2008, 2014, 2015, they move into Syria. And there's, I've got all support here for this, but if you want to have a look at that later, and I won't do that now, because we're going to run out of time. But you'll see what's going on there. This is all the stories that have happened. Now, I read out the thoughts of the, the, the Russian leader before. It seems to place a little bit of a curly uh, effect on when things are going to happen. It says, I, he has this thought, I'll go up to land of unwalled villages those living at peace and are, and are calm. And when, if you don't look at that properly, you might think, oh, that's got to happen at some time in the future. But in fact, it's happened in the past. And from the year 2009 to 2015, there were all sorts of newspaper stories in Israel talking about the calm, the calm, the calm, the calm. And guess what? When Russia moved into... Um, Syria in 2015, September 2015, the very next month, the stabbing intifada started in Jerusalem. A crisis in Jerusalem. And I'll refer to that in the beginning. So we should not be looking for the peace and the calm that comes in the thought of the Russian leader. It probably has already happened three or four years ago. And of course, Daniel chapter 8 says, he destroys the Israelis by peace and by deceit. We haven't got time to check that out. So 
that the speculation I would have there is that the Russian leader has been deceiving all the way along. So here's, I'm going to show you some of the newspaper headlines from that period. 2012 there. Relative calm on all Israel's border. There's another one. Amid relative calm, Hamas builds its Hezbollah style mini state. Here's another one, relative calm in Israel. And then there's a headline from a newspaper article, 13th of October 2015, after years of calm, fear is dividing Jerusalem. And so we move into a crisis for Jerusalem three years ago. And it has been ever so with Donald Trump announcing going to shift um, his capital, the, his embassy to Jerusalem, Australia, talk about the same thing. So Russia moved into Syria in September 2015 and are still there and have basically taken over um, Syria. And so we can say effectively that Russia became the king of the north, spoken of in Daniel chapter 11 from September 2015 onwards. And so when we read those verses back in verse 4 of Ezekiel 38, the Syrian civil war was probably the hook in the jaw to bring them into the Middle East. And there are other reasons for it too that they, they won't tell us. And so what we've seen is Syria in ruins, and that's prophesied in Isaiah 17. We haven't had time to look at that. But that prophecy, when you look at it, talks about events preceding the coming of the Lord. It says what's been happening in Syria. A mess. Absolute rubble. Now, Zechariah chapter 9 basically says, and we haven't got time to look at this either, that there won't be any rest in Syria until the Lord is present and people can look upon the Lord Jesus Christ in the world. Now, there's just a few of the things that have been... If you have a look at those few prophecies that we've dealt with tonight, we can see that we're at a very close point, aren't we? Now, I just want to deal with a couple of other... One other thing before we uh, stop tonight. And there's a lot more I could talk about, which you can see there as I'm going past it. Um, I actually presented this at Glenlock, uh, but a different sort of audience. I should have shortened it a little bit, so, but I tried to explain things a little bit more fully t tonight. When you've got an audience that um, knows fully what you're talking about, uh, then you can go much quicker. Now, as you know, uh, in 2003 and 2014, uh, there were two coalitions of nations brought into the Middle East. That's exactly and all these nations. In some cases, um, well, in the current situation, we've got in this, those that Obama called in in 2014, there's a list there of about 15 of them in the Middle East. All nations gathered to the Middle East, to the Valley of Jehoshaphat. That's on the other side, opposite the Russians. So if we come back to Joel 3 then, and this is where I want to finish, which we've looked at a couple of times tonight. I just want to point one thing out to you, which is quite significant. Now, Joel chapter 3, we looked at verses 1 and 2 basically, but if you go down to verse 9, there's a proclamation among the nations, prepare a war, rouse the mighty men, let all the soldiers draw near, let them come up, that is to Jerusalem, beat your plowshares into swords, your pruning hooks into spears, let the weaklings say I'm a mighty man, hasten and come all you surrounding nations and gather yourselves there. And then there's this little phrase in verse 11, bring down, O Lord, thy mighty ones. It's a prayer. So there's people praying 
bring down your champions, Lord. And then it says, let the nations be aroused and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the surrounding nations. Now, if we go back to the Revelation prophecy, which matches that, in chapter 16, which I read earlier, you'll see a parallel. And it's quite revealing. And before I read this, verse 14, they are spirits of demons performing signs which go out to the kings of the whole world to gather them together for the war of the great day of God the Almighty. And then there's inserted those words which I mentioned before, behold I'm coming like a thief. And then in verse 16, and they gathered them into the place in the Hebrew which is called Armageddon. Now what we have there is a parallel. Forces gathering, one in Joel says there's a prayer to God, and the other one's inserted with a warning from Christ that he's coming like a thief. And then they gather, this one in Joel says they gather in the Valley of Jehoshaphat, which exactly means Armageddon. And, they got, and in Revelation 16, it says in the next verse, and they gather in the place called Armageddon. And so the gathering is a sign, but it's like a big, it's a spectrum. And it starts here, it finishes there, and somewhere in the middle, we don't know where, the Lord says he's coming. So when we see the Russians preparing for war, when we see the Western nations in the Middle East right now, and have gathered there since 2000, well, in fact, since 1990, uh, 1990, and then 2003, 2014, we're on that spectrum. It can happen any time. So the message is, from chapter 16 of Revelation, Blessed is the one who stays awake and keeps his garments, lest he walk about naked and men see his shame. And those garments are the garments of salvation and righteousness, and that means we need to look very